Um, hello, everyone. Um, we're so excited to be hosting Neil Rock for an artist lecture surrounding his current solo exhibition in the Ruffing Gallery, Flesh Poems. Um, originally from South Wales, Neil joined the UVA faculty in 2018. Is that right, Neil? No, 2019. 2019. OK, I got that one wrong. <laughs> 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 um it's, as, COVID. Hmm? it's covid just put it you know that's, yeah, yeah what i don't even know what year it is um anyway 2019 as a painting professor um so we're really excited to be able to engage with his work um more intimately and hear about his practice um neil holds a practice-based phd in painting from london's royal college of art his work has been shown in a number of places, including the Albright Knox Art Gallery, the Wexner Center for the Arts, and the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, just to name a few. Um, Neil is gonna talk a little bit and share a presentation, and then he'll be joined by Professor Krista Robbins, um, and they'll talk a little bit, and then there'll be time um, at the end for some questions, and um, feel free to pop those in the Q&A section. Um, so if we're all good, Neil, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Liza. Um, okay. round of thanks, uh, first as well for Krista for being here today. I know you're busy. We're all busy at the moment. So thanks for taking the time to do this. Uh, Eric Schmidt, if only for his poker face that he showed in January when I told him we were going to be building walls in the Ruffin Gallery. <laughs> and we're not going to because we have to take the walls down as well. Um, Dan Hugenboom, obviously. Um, um, uh, Olivia Petit uh, for the interview that she very kindly conducted. Um, and also just broadly to the department as well. Um, the department and particularly studio for extending the warm welcome um, that I've been, you know, I'm relatively new, 2019 uh, since I've been here. So um, yeah, and to the students in the painting concentration, some of which hopefully a year today, you know, I mean, it makes my job easy when the students care and they're passionate and they, they really want to make art. And so it's great to be in conversation with them, too. Um, so I'm going to talk for about uh, 30 minutes um, and roughly give or take a few minutes. Um, then we're going to open it up to questions with Krista for about 15 minutes. And we've got time at the end uh, for questions in the chat. So I'm just going to start with a, a screen share. And uh, I'm just going to say a little bit about how I'm going to pre present this talk, because I think that matters at the, at the kind of front end. Um, I'm going to start with showing people images from the Ruffin show. Uh, and then I'm going to do a bit of a circuitous journey through um, various aspects of, of, of my work um, and the, the places uh, where the work's been. Because um, I think there's a very kind of awful preposition um, when people say, what the work is about. And I, I often think that it's best to think about where the work has been and, and what the work looks to. Um, and there's been multiple places of dwelling over the last uh, 20 years. And I think in order to understand the work at Ruffin, it's really important to, to look at um, where the work's been in, in the run up to this show, um, including kind of my physical space and mental space. And, and, and there's been multiple dwellings over the course of two decades. So it's just, I'm just gonna show you these images, which are installation shots of the show which um, I'm sure Eric has got fond memories of if he's here today. And it's uh, three sets of loosely termed triptychs. Um, and for scale, I'll go back to this one. The large one is around six foot to give you an idea for those that haven't seen it. I'm going to start with this painting, um, a very important painting to me it has been continues to be, I think it always will be uh, the Welsh painter Gwen John, who lived most of her adult life in Paris, in the suburbs of Paris. Um, I, I, I pick this painting first for many, for, for many reasons, but one of the main things is it continues to be a teaching tool for me um, uh, or a, a learning experience. I, I keep on coming back to this painting because one of the things Gwen John uh, kind of taught me was that there is uh, often not necessarily um, a direct relationship between um, subject matter depicted 
on the content of the work. Uh, sometimes they're in harmony, sometimes they're also, um, there are disjunctions and um, contradictions. And I think for me with Gwen Jong, um, I, you know, uh, it's important to say that I think that these works are, um, they, they involve themselves in modes of, of painting that are observational. Um, but I think they're also very much interior paintings. They're in, and they're entangled in that way. Um, if you look at the way the thing is painted, and I, and I use the word thing deliberately because I think they are things um, that are creaturely value to this painting, as well as there is a depth of humanity. Um, and the, the way that the, if you look at the dry brushwork, if you look at the pendamenti, there's shards and very delicate shards of painting coming through this work. Um, and I think that's really indicative of many of Gwen John's paintings um, from this particular period. Um, and there's another thing that's really important to me as well, which is the, um, the piece of paper or um, this aspect of the painting where we can't really, we'll, we'll never really know what's been written there. There's something, there's something being withheld. Um, and I'm going to return to this idea of uh, opacity um, uh, throughout, throughout the talk. Um, and a shift, which is, as you all will probably assume, going from Gwen John to uh, 80s, what you call in America the, the mom and pop video store, the VHS video store, which were not only common in the US, but common, of course, in the UK and many other countries. Um, and one of the things, the other thing, which is a kind of learning experience for me with, with Gwen John is thinking outside the form of the work, um, thinking outside of image, thinking around image and on the edges of image with paintings. Um, and this is the way I think about these places. I, I think often um, in terms of thinking outside galleries um, and museums, uh, which is ironically where a lot of my work gets shown, what are the repositories of culture that we have that we can have, we, we can see value in that have been devalued or not given much value. Uh, and in that sense, the video store for me was it was a museum space. Um, and my mind continues to go back to these spaces because not only am I interested in a particular genre, and I say genre loosely because we're talking about body horror films from the late 70s and, and uh, throughout the 80s. It was a golden pe period of prosthetic special effects um, from late 70s onwards. Um, and there were films like this, um, like stuff. Um, and I became, and still am, as interested in the, uh, the artwork on the box covers as I was the films themselves. I actually haven't seen the stuff in quite a long time. I've seen it many times over. Um, but it's also thinking about the, what might be in the quote unquote movie, right? And I use the word movie, not films. I think these are popcorn B movies. Um, and I think, you know, for me, it's important to keep the, that form intact and not try to rehabilitate it into some, you know, um, museological kind of language. Um, and combining it with, uh, this is a, a film, a cult film now by Catherine Bigelow, Near Dark, um, and combining it with histories of painting that you might not necessarily put together with something like Near Dark, um, if only for the, the soundtrack of Near Dark as well, Tangerine Dream, I think was the, um, the soundtrack for the, for the movie. Um, and there's multiple ways I can relate these two things. I started to think about Rachel Royce. I mean, you know, a golden age of special effects, the golden age of, you know, the Dutch golden age of painting. Uh, and Royce was a preeminent painter of that period. And I'm thinking about these things as, and particularly Royce as a, a, as a master craftsperson of special effects. I mean, people that would know uh, these histories or the history of aspects of Dutch still life that these are, of course, fabulations, um, flowers blooming at different seasons. Um, and also in terms of the hierarchy of genres, um, I think there's a very strong correlation here between flower painting being at the bottom of hierarchy of genres of that period and, and around those particular centuries. Um, and these kinds of B-movies having a similar kind of place um, in a kind of collective cultural consciousness, if you, if you want to put it that way. I, uh, I had some teething problems with, I, I wanted to show a clip from Evil Dead 2, but I'm going to show this video still um, instead. Um, and thinking about, again, within these films, um, uh, particularly this film, the Evil, the Evil Dead 2 by Sam Raimi, if nobody's aware of his opus, he was pretty famous for these films in the 80s. I think he's probably better known in, in recent times for the Spider-Man trilogy. Um, but this was a film that had an importance to me in terms of um, 
thinking about the special effects, thinking within and outside the form of the movie. Um, and at the same time, um, this kind of loose genre of body, body horror films. Um, but the influences on this movie, I think, are really interesting, right? I mean, you, you, it gets categorized as a zombie movie. There's a kind of element of slapstick or comedy. But really, if you look at this film, the movie, there's a lot of influences coming from cartoons like Tom and Jerry, um, slapstick physical comedy of Harpo Marx. Um, and I think it's really important not to try to, um, what I would say, bastardize the form of the work, um, to not make it into a film, to not talk about it as if it's a film. Um, and that's been really kind of important to me particularly in, in my early work. Um, this is, I'm, I'm jumping to uh, work from the early 2000s. I'm not gonna say too much. You've got the information at the bottom of the screen there, but I'm gonna say a little bit about um, how it was made. Um, these were icing cake um, nozzles and pastry bags with silicon pumped through them um, and uh, acrylic paint in cake trays, dried in cake trays. Um, and synthetic flowers uh, taken from what you, we call here in America, dollar stores, they're called pound shops in, in, in the UK, more or less cultural equivalents. Um, Polari might be of interest to a few people. It's not something that is um, uh, a, a word that's kind of commonly, commonly known or used. It belongs to uh, a slang language or dialect uh, that came to prominence or was used widely um, in uh, London and around the UK in theatre circles and in the Navy. But, you know, uh, particularly for me and my interest was it was used predominantly by gay men um, in a culture um, that at that time, you know, uh, saw homosexuality as criminal and indeed, you know, criminalized homosexuality until 1967. It's also worth bearing in mind that, you know, it wasn't until 1980 in the US that um, the Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders um, only took it off uh, in its, its books, so to speak, as a, as a, as a sexual perversion in 1980. Um, and so for me, what was interesting about this was that Pilar was a slang language that was made up of backslang, Cockney rhyming slang, uh, Latin. Um, and it was used as a means, you know, this is language used not only as a means of communication, but language used as a means of protection, as a means of preservation, uh, and, a, and a means of hiding in plain sight in a culture that, that, that deemed particular kinds of people um, criminal uh, and inhuman to a certain extent. And this has a relationship really, and I, this would be something that will come up in later aspects of this talk about my uh, somewhat conflicted relationship with the Welsh language Cymraeg. Um, as, as many people know, I'm from Wales. Um, I identify as Welsh and not British for very political reasons. Um, and my relationship to that language is one, one uh, of a monoglot. I don't speak the language. Um, and my experiences of Welsh growing up in South Wales, um, it's an officially a bilingual country where only 20% of the people speak Welsh. Um, and in the region that I grew up in, it wasn't really a spoken language. Um, but in seeing that, my, my relationship with, with Welsh Cymraeg was also seeing it as a, as, a, as, a, as a means of masking, a means of veiling, a means of protecting, and a means of creating a kind of opacity to certain bodies. Um, and these, these were parallel conversations that I was seeing in looking at you know, histories of Polari to a certain extent. And then we jump forward a little bit um, to uh, Judith Butler on the one hand, and then way, way back in time to, uh, this is a pretty new addition in the history of Herman sculptures. Uh, 50 to 100 AD, but they go back over two and a half thousand years. Um, I'm going to read this quote. It's worth kind of um, me kind of uh, going into it a bit. It does not follow that if a life needs some narrative structure, then all of life must be rendered in narrative form. Speaking I does not mean we cannot narrate it. It only means that at the moment when we narrate, we become speculative philosophers or fiction writers. Now, my interest in this is the, is, is the speculative uh, aspect of, of the I pronoun. And of course, the I pronoun is echoed in the whom itself. My interest in whom is really, I only came across about 12 years ago. 
um, they are very much part, or they were in their in their earliest iterations, participatory objects. But they weren't just sculptures to be um, to be seen and to be um, seen in a kind of uh, at an aesthetic distance. Um, they were markers of boundaries in territories um, in and around uh, Athens. Um, they marked um, uh, territory. Um, they often had inscriptions of uh, spatial markers and distances. They were also a portrapaic objects. They were objects of magic and ritual. They were touched for good luck. They were fertility icons. And they also contained phalluses. So they, there is a phallic form echoed in, in many of them, a phallus at the midsection. So why, I, I'm sure you're all thinking, does this term has, have anything to do with Judith Butler? Well, for me, um, I started to see the home as a possibility for intervening, getting myself out of my work. Um, and what I'm really aware of this is that, you know, as I felt the need that I needed to kind of um, have some in intervention um, in with, quote unquote, myself, a kind of subject or agency, um, I'm also aware that this is not the same um, across the board. I'm not trying to make an essentialist argument here, um, particularly with the idea that in some in some respects, particularly as I've just talked about Polari, there is there are many communities and peoples and subjects that have never had the luxury of of fiction in the first place, or to or to speculate about being fiction. Um, I think that's important to state as we move forward. I did the obvious thing, guys. I I made things that look like cones. Um, I, I'm showing them because I, I think, to be quite frank, they're terrible. Um, but they were, that was my first response. Um, and um, the found objects came into the work at this point. Um, I, I'm not big on biographical material too much, but it's important to note that I'd moved from, from the UK to the US and the West Coast at this point. Um, and this was a studio that I had in South Central Los Angeles, which I kept for many, many years. Um, and these found, quote unquote, found, I, I see them as lost objects in ways, were um, salvaged from the streets around uh, my studio in South Central. And as you'd imagine, we go from that to uh, the French performance artist, Ola. Now, what I'm doing here, which I think is important, is I started to think of the home not as a physical object, but as a, as a, as a, a speculative thing, and a speculative object that I could carry with me. Um, that could allow me to um, have a kind of material history with work to think about um, silicon, which was my paint medium, and think about where it was embedded culturally in other artists' works um, in various as aspects of material culture. Um, Orlan is famous for these surgical performances in the early 1990s where she had silicon prosthetic objects inserted into her face. And these were, you know, I, I think in, in many regards, kind of important uh, feminist performance pieces in that she was um, using this as a critique of male images of female beauty in the Western painting canon. Uh, and one of the people that she was critiquing, of course, would be um, either the, the darling or the villain of the Ancien Régime, regime um, in France, um, Francois Boucher. Um, I've always been interested in Boucher for, for, for several reasons. One of the main things is that I, I think he has a, a fetishistic relationship to the human body. He was always, he was, for the most part, painting, um, you know, Madame Pompadour was his uh, muse for various reasons. Um, but if you look at the faces of Francois Boucher's paintings, um, they tend to look the same. Um, they have a kind of doll-like quality. Um, but if you look at the way he paints clothes and finery, um, there's a different attention to detail and a different fascination. Um, and for me, this has been a point of interest in the sense that it's a relationship to the body that's indirect. Um, that is an indirect look, if you like. And so I began um, then to think about where these um, indirect relationships to bodiliness or latent forms can exist. Caro is, you know, um, perhaps better known for his, you know, modernist monumental sculptures, but I actually think that these works, which are ancillary to his practice, kind of tertiary or secondary, um, the table sculptures he did throughout his life, um, but they always had the, the constructedness of the ledge or the shelf. Um, and they had a relationship to still life painting. Um, and for me, looking at these, I saw them, I see them as latent forms. They're forms that, that contain possibility um, and, and, and maybe rehabilitation, but not in the way that I was critiquing with um, the earlier kind of B movies. And so I came up with these works. Um, these are skins of silicon paint sprayed um, uh, with a, um, 
an airbrush, uh, silicon paint airbrushed onto the, uh, the forms, steel, steel supports. And then there was an evolution in the work um, in that I, I, I managed to find a way through a, um, a provisional and adapted monotyping process of transferring digital images onto skins of silicon. Um, and it was a way for me at the time, I, I felt there was far too much of a concern or an emphasis on the materiality and the surface of the material itself. I wanted to kind of have images that could take people away from that or take myself as a viewer away from that to a certain extent. Um, and that brings us up to a work that's actually in the Ruffin Gallery now. This was made originally back in 2016 when I was doing a fellowship at the University of Iowa. Uh, it was exhibited in London initially and now it's, and now it's here at Ruffin. Um, this is an image, a digital image of um, a charcoal drawing photographed through lace. Um, And the home, as a hermeneutic object, as an object that can carry different modes of, um, different means of translation. Um, for me, one of the reasons why I've shown everybody um, the earlier work is that I, I, I think I can't take this work out of Dutch still life. And I, at the same time as I can't take it out of body horror movies, um, and I can't take it out of uh, a relationship to paint and surface at the same time. And then we go to what is really a precursor to where I'm at right now, um, drawing. And, you know, I came to the end of what I thought this work was doing for a while. Um, or I think I got really tired, I think, to be honest. Um, and I had an opportunity to do a residency in uh, upstate New York. And for the first time, I thought um, I really wanted to challenge myself and, I think what happens sometimes with artists, of course, not all artists, some, um, in my experience, many that I've known over the years, um, there's a point where techniques and tools and territories get very familiar. Um, they can enter a mannerist phase or they can enter a point of re repetition and absurdum. I think that, you know, I don't know, I, I still felt there was potential in that older work, but I needed to do something to get away from what I felt was a fatigue with that work. Um, so I did this residency, and the only thing I took with me was um, uh, charcoal paper, uh, paper uh, and pencil, and a needed and a few needed erasers. Um, and I'll be honest, it was a really difficult time with this work. Um, you, what you're seeing now is actually the tail end of the residency. This is the work that actually came out of many weeks of um, drawing lines. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to draw. Um, there was, you know, a strong sense of redundancy, um, of um, a real uncomfortable, um, a kind of un being uncomfortable in not knowing what I was doing. Um, but out of that came, um, and I don't think I, I've, I've learned to value and sit with those things as an artist a lot more now than I did when I was uh, much younger. And I started to see that you know, one of the reasons I was using lines is because I couldn't think of anything more boring and basic and obvious than drawing a line. Um, even, even knowing that there are many kind of, you know, iterative, diaristic, existential histories of abstract kind of painting that really have an enriched relationship to line. And of course, not just that, but many other traditions too. Um, I was thinking that line, you know, I started to understand that line could be something um, not talked about, but felt. Line was a container or a kind of, um, a container for, for emotional resonances within work. You know, these in particular kind of not, a knottedness, a knotted kind of anxiety. Line is a kind of form of kind of ordering and clearing. Line is a way of creating um, uh, sculptural forms that have a, a, a kind of, you know, leaning or sagging, which interestingly, I think, as a relationship to the work I'm doing now. And then also taking control of the container. You know, I've always been interested in, you know, the frame, where the frame ends and begins in work. 
Um, and I mean frame literally, but I also mean frame in terms of, um, you know, hermeneutically, you know, what um, Hans Georg Gadamer would call a kind of, you know, the, uh, the, the meeting of horizons. Where, what, what are the, the kind of limits of, of our horizon thinking um, in work? And so the galleries I started to, when I work with galleries now, I, 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 I tend to be a lot more kind of hands-on in, in, in creating an environment that houses the work. And so I'm showing you this because um, it's very similar to what we did at Ruffin. This is at uh, South Dakota State University in 2018. And so this drawing practice continued and I'll be honest with this work, you know, I, I think that a lot of the drawings, um, they, they, they rest somewhere between um, alluding to form, um, form that might, might one recognize, um, um, that have a relationship to the face, uh, amongst many other things, but they also stop short of going there, they stop short of, of, of really going into that. Um, and that takes us to Henry Tonks, which... Um, you know, the essay by Susanna Burnoff, the British art historian who wrote the, um, the essay, Flesh Poems, which the show is titled afterwards. And, um, you know, Henry Tonks is a really interesting one because um, on one hand, there are these kind of flights, flights of journey that cross over other people. He, he taught Gwen John at the Slade School of Art in the late 19th century. Um, and he taught there as a professor of anatomy um, and drawing. Um, in the early 20th century as well, taught many painters, including people like Gwen John and Paul Nash and others. Um, but, you know, these have a, uh, an interesting place in his um, output. Um, he was asked by uh, one of the modern day precursors of plastic surgery, so um, Harold Gillies, um, uh, to record Gillies's operations of veteran uh, soldiers returning from, from the war from, in the First World War. And in this particular instance, uh, not only did he draw the before and after, but he also drew the surgical procedure itself. Um, and what I'm interested in, in with this is that one, they don't exist largely in museums. They exist in um, surgical uh, and medical archives. Um, Tonks didn't realize at the time that, I mean, I, I think that this is Tonks' best work. And again, this is work that sits outside the form of his painting, right? In, in, the, same, in the same way, um, that the content of a Gwen John painting sits outside aspects of, of image. Um, and these, these particular drawings kind of sit um, outside of what was considered at his time is, is artistic output. But I also think they're images of absolute tenderness, beauty, and, and um, you know, bodily discomfort. Um, and, and to a certain extent, they speak to a horror um, which we, we quite frankly don't have words for, right? Um, and they've stayed with me, um, but they stayed with me for another reason, because I think that there's something about disfiguration here that is important as a kind of starting place for a conversation about abstract painting, or, or at least what I'm interested in with that with abstract painting. Um, um, and that is that it, it's something disfigured within the work um, that is on the way to being something else. Um, and I think that that's where the drawings um, are kind of, that's where I'm kind of locating the drawings at the moment with the work. And with that said, I'm going to go now through um, some of the work that's um, at Ruffin um, uh, piece by piece. And I'm going to, you know, I'll say a few things about them. I, I just want them to, hopefully they've accrued some kind of value or some kind of, of, of various resonances through some of the things that I've, um, I've been talking about. The interesting thing is what I didn't touch upon with Tonks is that he, he felt that the sense of touch, the sense of ha the haptic in drawing was really important. Um, and he taught that at the Slade, you know, um, in his typical draconian style. That he was always, you know, he was, yeah, and, and Susanna Burnoff talks about this as well, that he felt that drawing was nothing if it didn't have a relationship to touch. Um, and that's in, very interesting in relation to the surgical procedures that he was, he was drawing uh, many you know, years later. This is one of the first pieces in the show. If you, if you look at the work from, um, in clock, you know, clockwork fashion from, from left to right. Um, 
I'll say a little bit about the titles. I mean, first of all, I'll say a little bit about um, the concave form. This is one of the first times where I've really explored concave forms rather than convex forms. They have a hollowed out kind of quality to them. They also have matte surfaces for the most part. Some of them are um, have a luster, but they're matted. Um, uh, and I, I, I think it's important to say, and many people might have got this from the show already, but I don't see the ledge as a display, just it's intrinsic to the work. It is display, but it's also uh, not just an afterthought, af afterthought or a display mechanism in and of itself. There's something about the crispness of the line that runs through the show and the way that the work kind of relates to that line and disrupts the line. Um, Boston Elbow is a is a, a, a pioneer, pioneering um, moment, I suppose, in prosthetic limbs. Uh, 1968, I think it was. Um, it was the first um, prosthetic uh, arm that had a relationship between kind of new neural uh, signals to the brain to the to the mechanism. Uh, T. Bach. Um, for those that know their colloquial Welsh, Cymraeg, uh, it literally means small house, but colloquially means toilet. Canavin is an untranslatable, um, it doesn't have an English language equivalent. Um, it usually gets interpreted as habitat, but it means much more than that. It means a space, a, a place of rightful belonging. Um, I, I, I encountered it growing up. It, it's connotations of spiritual dwelling and spiritual belonging. Um, fragments of words as well. Um, uh, a lot of the, the drawings have a relationship to um, what could be, you know, floral kind of um, patterning or designs, but they don't really, um, they really don't go down that, fully down that path to be articulated in quite that way. Um, fauna usually gets associated with the flora, um, and there's a few words, uh, titles in here that have um, various kind of uh, fractures within them. And then I'm just going to run through um, the last few. And, um, you know, and, and where I'm at right now with this work, I, I, this was the, the, I guess, the centerpiece of the show. I, I wanted to kind of show this again. I hadn't seen it for quite some time. And one of the things I, I, I talked to some of the students about um, in the painting concentration is the importance of viewing. Um, and you know, I, I think I place a much more, a much stronger emphasis now in in my work on viewing than I do making. I, I'm very much involved in making. I believe in in the in in that as as a as a place of generating meaning. Um, but being a viewer of the work is important, and seeing this after a few years was important. Aftercare. Um, it belongs in a kind of lexicon and terminology of BDSM. Um, again, it's something that, that is uh, a term that exists in the aftermath of or, or um, outside of a particular scene. Lepsis, a fragment word, um, has pharmacological uh, references, um, amongst other things. And then I'm going to end with this. I'm, I'm about uh, 31 minutes, so uh, I think... It, I couldn't think of a better place to end than Zizek's. Um, it's worth pointing out that California is a is a home of mine, and Zizek is is a is a is a town, um, a desert town on the edge of the Mojave National Preserve. Um, and a lot of these words, you know, I, I think these 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 uh, works can be containers for things. And I think, in a way, that the the titles are are, are um, um, there's a loose grip between the titles and the works in that they can both be um, in dialogue but containers at the same time. So um, I'll end it there. I'm on uh, just, just over 31. So um, thanks for listening, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, so we're now going to open it up to um, Krista for some questions with Neil. Um, and then following that, um, you all will be able to ask questions. Um, and a few of you have already done that in the Q&A section. Feel free to do that. Thanks, Krista. Thank you, Neil. Um, a lot, there's a lot going on there. And I'm, I want to, 
I want to get you to tie at least two of the theme, maybe three of these, these, these um, thematics that you touched on together. And it's something that, that I was thinking about before your talk. So I'm, I'm glad that my own instincts were confirmed by what you had to say. But um, I am looking at the show was thinking a lot about line and gesture in relation to these, um, these, these artificial and, 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 and prosthetic type, type forms. Um, and, and I was also thinking a little bit about um, the way in which you as an artist um, seem very persistently obscured in this work. So it's interesting that you talk about you bring up Butler um, in that regard. Um, But I was also thinking about the way in which that obscuring that that the way in which you can in your work seemingly evoke bodies without drawing attention to your body or you know naming a body it seems to be addressed to the body. I was thinking about that and I was thinking about some feminist work um, and in particular Hannah Wilka, I think just because of the, the morphologically there's some commonalities there. Hannah Wilka's um, starification where um, for those of you who don't know it in 75, she did a performance where she asked viewers to come into a gallery and chew bubble gum of varying colors. And then she would take it from them and she would form them into these very va purposefully vaginal little, little sculptures. And then she stuck them all over her body and eventually it turned into this editorial um, photo piece. Um, so Wilka is taking these, these, these very, um, these literally bubblegum, these very artificial type, type materials, forming them into sculptures and then placing them in relationship to her body, evoking the female body and what's most sort of <laughs> un, under discussed in the female body. Um, I've seen that her and also it didn't, I can't believe it didn't occur to me until you were talking, but it was when you talked about Caro, I started thinking about Banglas and Bang Linda Banglas. And in the same way that Wilka takes these little sculptural forms and literally puts them on her body, Banglas who made work that was about a body in a way that your, your work is a lot about, always um, spoke very openly about and made work about the fact that you couldn't, people wouldn't separate her work from her body. As a female sculptor, her body was always insinuated back into that work, and 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 Wilk is obviously doing something really similar. Mm. Um, so I want to—I just kind of want to ask you to to talk about that a little bit. Um, the way in which, I mean, I think that your sculptures are really interestingly not gendered, even though they evoke kind of feminine aesthetics in a way that the Polari paintings seem more aggressively gendered, these feel very um, ungendered or um, a, I don't want to say agendered. So is this something that you are purposefully cultivating here? Um, are you thinking about the body? Are you thinking about a body? And I also just maybe want to a little provocatively have you respond a little bit to the kind of privilege that comes from being a white man who can dissociate his body from his sculptures in a way that a lot of artists can't. So that's a, that's a whole cluster of, of, of thinking and questioning. And I'd mm. just love to hear what you're thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot in there. Um, um, and I'll, I'll pick up at, at the end, really. And I think I mentioned this in the talk, but, you know, that sense of privilege, you know, that Judith Butler quote is, is a really important one because, um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that she wrote that, um, but at the same time, it is predicated on a kind of privilege, right? Um, and for me, um, what's important within that is, you know, if there's an edifice of privilege there in terms of being, you know, white, being male, coming, you know, being born into a certain um, periodizations of history, the privileged Western, Western art history, certain narratives, you know, which you've really eloquently talked about. I, I recently read your um, 
uh, eloquent take down of uh, Michael Fried again, you know, um, because they're not broke down. I just narrated it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, but you know, it's, it's an important it's, it's an important thing to, to kind of point out um, that then there, there has to be a process of undoing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that process of um, undoing can be done with it, it. There needs to be impositions there, right? Um, and at least that's my way of thinking about it, right? So you, you could you could look at it as, on the one hand, um, I'm using histories that are in that canon. So, for example, Ulapu, right? The Workshop for Potential Literature, which is a big boys club. Um, you know, Duchamp, Perec, Harry Matthews, Calvino. You know, the big the big dudes. Um, but at the same time, understanding that those restraints were predicated on our privilege. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that sense, um, the forms that I make, I'm very careful. That one of the reasons why I'm not using my biography is because it's a biography that I think needs to be undone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, the the video store, for example, the B movies, um, um, they're forms of of undoing. Um, and so, within the work, you know, I mean, I obviously I, I love Bengliss's work. Um, um, and I think in some regards, the, the work is coming out of diaristic gesture. It's coming out of these histories which have privileged um, a, certain kinds of be- uh, bodies being able to act, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the, 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 the classic, really obvious, cliched Pollock space of performance, right? Which I, I just get, I, I cringe when I, when I hear it often. Um, but that is, a, that is a huge performance space that needs to be tr- troubled and has been, right? Obviously since. Um, and, you know, the important thing for me is that, you know, I feel like my work at the end of the 1990s when I went to art school was, was began on the foundation of these critiques, right? Now, you either respond to those or you don't. They need responding to, I think. Um, and so when you look at my work, it's difficult to know if, you know, I, I don't know if it's easy to see if it's male or female or we have these kind of binaries. And for me, it's important that you can't. Mm-hmm. do that mm-hmm. and that there are mixed signals and I think part of that mix that part of that mixed signaling also comes from what is a complicated relationship to empire and language through Camry, right yeah. you know that you can be in a place of extreme privilege within the walls of empire and at the same time with Camry, which I saw used and weaponized and politicized in ways that made me understand that language is is always at stake in work, yeah. you know, and it's so really me- interesting that you, um, cause I don't want to, I don't want to lose this thread too quickly, but just understanding this and, and having and under and having this kind of in place critique of the gesture, um, you often still begin with the gesture. You begin with the hand-drawn line. And, and I know that you've told me that there's the, a thumb, like the shape itself is coming from a thumbprint of some of these. Yeah. So you're you're in there. So do you need to have that sort of authorial act that then you then sort of literally mediate through all these material these materials? Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. It's only authorial if you think it is, because the authority, you know, I, I think authoring, you know, um, uh, who is the guy that's part of the um, Bernadette Corporation? What is his name again? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, them, but... Anyway, there's, some, there's something he said that's stuck in my, it's just collective writings there. They're on um, Sternberg Press, uh, published them a few years ago. Uh, something he said that's stuck in my mind. He said, you know, the, the artist that, 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 um, that turns up to the studio and makes the work is not necessarily the same person that authors it, right? Mm-hmm. And for me, there is an overdetermined, or can be, let me just be careful not to make any kind of, you know, uh, sweeping statements, but there can be a problem when you place so much cultural value on authoring at the point of making and not authoring at the point of reception and viewing, right? And I think that's part of the problem. The problem is not in the making, because, you know, because what you're doing is, right, not you, but what one does is you tie authorship to intentionality and making, the act of making. There's this fetishization around the act of making, right? And very little, relatively speaking, to the authoring of receptivity and viewership, right? And if you think about it logically, most artists spend much of their time viewing way more than they do making, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a kind of making untethered from, or at least I'm trying to untether the cultural hierarchy between that and sitting there. Because also when I was doing the, the 
you know, you're referring to the um, concave forms of the new work, right? And I was, I was, I was needing clay, um, special effects modeling clay in my hands in the studio in the summer, bored and in my mind, not knowing what to do. Um, that's what happens in the studio. Yeah, but I love just for students to hear that, that that's where ideas come from. I'm just sitting there. <laughs> I you know. I was having a really, right. I was having a really bad time last summer trying to figure. I just didn't know where. To, I couldn't find a way of transferring the the drawings to these new new pieces. So I was just, I was just thumbing this clay, and I was like, oh, this this concave form, you know. But so in a way, what I'm saying is it ties into what you're talking about is that really kind of isn't authoring in the same way that we're talking about. That's almost a kind of idle boredom and mindlessness which has a relationship to the doodle, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also think just um, in thinking about making its viewing, just something I write about a lot, um, that those, those, latter, those later steps seem, seem quite visible in your work, I think in an important way so that, um, so that you're not just coming in as the authority in the last moment, which is what like post painterly abstraction did that like they made through viewing and it's because they were came in almost like the critic and they're like that's the painting I want to hang and that's the one I'm going to destroy mm -hmm. there's a way in which there's still a process of mediation that's on display there and I'm thinking in particular and I didn't really notice this until you, the way you photographed it but the way you photographed Lepsis I thought was so interesting because it shows the seams that you know it, it breaks the artifice of the prosthetic and the back of the of the of the object, um, and then also the walls as well. This shows this really intentional intervention, you know, after the quote unquote making, after the gesture. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yes, <I'm> fine. <laughs> um, yes, you're right, Krista. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. Or no, you're not. Right? Everything, everything you just said. Yeah. <laughs> I had something. I had something in mind. I was going to pick up on. Oh, that was the it. That, no, no, no. Yeah, no. This is what. This was. This is why. Because you said something about a minute ago that I. I thought was important. I think it's important not to offload the the values that we that one tends to place on uh, um, authorship and offload that to the onto viewership. That's really. The, I think that's really important. Because what all you then all you're doing then is just it's just you, you're basically moving the thing around, right? I think the shape needs to change. Now, uh, some of the students in painting have, have um, uh, read this when I when I first got here. It was um, Helen Helen Molesworth's um, "How to Be a Feminist Curator," and mm -hmm. you know the important thing about that is she said it's not enough to put um, you know forms that have been or, or people that have been traditionally othered, right? Um, and put them in forms that are in and of themselves um, problematic. So in other words, you can't just put the form of, you, you can't, you know, it's not good enough to, in some regards to have an emancipatory kind of gesture Im implemented within, within a, um, a, um, an imperialist kind of form, right? Yeah. The form has to change in a way. It has to fundamentally be different. And I think that's the problem of offloading. And it's, it's you know, it, there's a correlation here in, in terms of my thinking, is to not take those values of, of intentionality and authorship and then give them the same form through viewership, right? Yeah. So, and I know that Liza maybe wants to get to the Q&A, but I just want to say one thing about what, just in response to what you just said, which is to go back to the butler. The butler is, butler, yes, identifies the eye as the narrating eye. And so she is, she's, demonstrating still her attachment or not her attachment but his, her understanding of the eyes in somewhat some manner fictional right but that entire book giving an account of oneself is about the necessity to name the place from which you speak right and to not offload intentionality or agency or to disown it such that somebody else has to pick it up and she acknowledges that disowning agency and authorship that comes from places of power so i think that i think that does align with what you just said about you know not offloading <laughs> authority the authority onto somebody else um mm -hmm. onto the viewer or to whomever um mm -hmm. yeah, so we, we we acknowledge that the place from which we speak changes that it's the eye who speaks might be a different eye from the one who spoke yesterday but we still have to name the place from which we speak and, and that's mm -hmm. a responsibility ethically mm -hmm. according to Butler for um yeah, for yeah. okay 
So I'm sorry, but I know we have very little time, Liza. I didn't want to take up everybody's. Um... You're totally fine. And thank you so much, Krista. Um, and thank you so much, Neil. Um, I'm going to just do some maneuvering here. Um, I'm going to um, ask the questions. Feel free to pop more in if you all um, think of anything. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to read them. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Tyler Joe Smith. Um, she says, I'm just wondering how being based in the U.S. Has impacted your artistic practice, given your comments at the start of the talk about your background and the Welsh language. Mm. You know, it's really interesting. I mean, it's, a, it's a good question in the sense that I felt like I was already in an American context with this you know, we, we grew up in, in Wales with American movies. I mean, I know I appreciate that's not the same as being in this country. Um, so there's a strange sense for me of coming here of, of familiar, familiarity in terms of, you know, various aspects of American culture, if you can be that, you know, generalistic, but, um, and then estrangement at the same time. I can say, I mean, you know, in terms of place, you know, because we have to be really local. Let's get really specific, right? I've lived in California and in Southern California, um, and I've lived in Virginia uh, very recently. Um, and I do think that um, phys physically being in Southern California um, uh, and in terms of space and light, just on a purely optical kind of ontological kind of level, um, has had a, an impact on the work in terms of its um, uh, tonality, uh, not directly, but certainly sub, you know, um, indirectly. I mean, I've, I've noticed it. Um, I mean, Krista, you lived in, in Southern California. Yes, well, and I missed the light, yes. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I also think that um, in terms of my Welsh identity and coming from, from that place, um, you know, coming to a place and being perhaps hypersensitive to um, this being the empire of our times and the inequities. You know, Britain, let's just say Britain for a second, because there are there are common threads between Wales and England and Scotland and the other places. You know, we, we have far much of a, a, a more of a socialist and social kind of residue, political residue in, in Britain than we, than we do in the United States. Um, so politically and economically, I've been really aware of inequities that um, historically and even presently get, get, get kind of brushed under the carpet. So there's, there's various things there. You know, I think it's, you know, physiological, political, existential. Um, uh, and I continue to be sensitive to those things, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think um, Bill Wiley asked this question. I think he's um, talking about the um, Tonks's work, um, but he says, um, why did they want plastic surgical work um, documented with painting instead of photography? Um, is, the, is it the abstraction expected? And if you want to speak on that. Yeah, I mean, there were photographs, Bill. There, there were photographs in addition to Tonks. Um, and uh, even Gillies himself did some did, did drawings too. And um, I, I think it had something to do with the relationship of Gillies and Tonks. They knew each other quite well. Um, and, you know, Tonks was one of the preeminent drafts people of his time, right? You know, he, he was quite a celebrated draw, a, a, a professor of anatomy and drawing. So um, I don't know, I'm going to be really honest, I don't, I, I don't have a direct obvious answer. I don't know if there was a, com a specific conversation between Tonks and Gillies as to why, but I, I, have, I, have some, I think it's got something to do with the way that Tonks there was a trust between Tonks and Gillies that he felt that the pastels could bring out something existential and intimate in a way that the photography couldn't potentially. That would be my um, my stab at it. Um, I mean, the other thing is, well, just quick, quickly, Tonks was also um, on, on the war front. He was in, in the Second World War as well. So I think what might have happened was uh, Gillies was also thinking that not only was Tonks technically invested but he was absolutely um he was ravaged by his experiences in the second world war so he was also emotionally invested and there's something there now you could also argue that of course you can do that in photography as well but yeah 
I wonder, were the paintings circulated in some manner more than the, pho the photographs? I mean, I've seen the photographs. They're, they're almost they're really difficult to look at in a way that Tonks paintings aren't. Mm. Is that maybe that's, is that, what was, did he say something about abstraction, Liza? There's some like desire to obscure. Yeah, is, um, is it the abstraction expected? It also might have been, speaking to that, it also might have been, again, I'm speculating, but I, it also might have been because just, just exactly what you said, Krista, that people might have been able to digest the pastels more than the photographs, you know? Um, okay. Bill's raising his hand here, saying First World War, less accurate, um, potentially. Yeah. Wait, yeah. Um, okay, so Elizabeth Scheuer um, would like you to speak on the relationship you see or not between um, line and form. Uh, inextricable. Um, I think, well, I, I think line is form, to be honest. Um, and it's a good question because I think that separation is an interesting one because I think line, um, you know, I mean, God, it, it, we, it's, it's, a, it's another talk altogether, isn't it, depending on which where you look back in history what 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 cultures you look to i mean um for me line is form in the sense that it could it, and i think i spoke to this you know in the talk that it it can be something that um uh, creates a boundary or a division but it also can be a container and in that sense of it being a container and i i i, I think of it as an emotional container it is a container that has emotional form embedded within it. And that's to do with, you know, the way that a, a line is drawn. Like a lot, a lot of these works are adaptive monotypes. Um, and there's a, a, you know, there's a, there's a particular, there are particular kind of um, qualities of line. And of course, you know, I think hopefully a chem is here tonight, you'd probably speak to it far more eloquently than I could. Um, but there's that noise that you get, you know, it's called noise, I think, in printmaking, right? We get my printmaking hat on. Um, that, you, that, that physical bodily line is form, right? And you get that with monotyping and monoprinting and other kind of transfer processes, which, again, you know, this, this, this transfer, and it's interesting, you know, we, we had Oscar Murillo in um, last semester in, in painting and of course, he's he's done a lot of you know very well known kind of monotyping techniques, and he says similar things that it kind of creates a blindness to oneself. I mean, he's a very different relationship to me, but um, so yeah, I I would say Elizabeth that it, I I see it. I think it is form, and I think it's then it's then molded through a relationship to other forms. So, and we're gonna just do this one last question before we wrap things up. Um, this is coming from Isabella Whitfield. Um, and she says, how do you think about the backsides of your objects considering that they are partially visible in many of the works in the Ruffin installation? Yeah, because you can see the you can see those edges and those rips and those tears. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, I, I, I gave some thought to this when I was making the work and I, it's similar to some of the uh, earlier work that preceded it. Um, it looks kind of rough and edgy, and uh, not edgy, that's not the right word. Um, um, <laughs> edgy. Yeah, really edgy. Um, really cutting edge. <laughs> cutting edge, haven't got um, it. Looks, it, it looks, uh, it has the, um, um, a provisional and awkward quality to it. Mm -hmm. And if you look really close, you'll see that there are little tears and uh, fissures and, um, uh, holes where the nails have been pinned and for me that's a kind of you know I left it there because me for me that's a kind of looking behind the curtain you know um, it's a kind it's 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 work within the work that would some people might think is not intentional you could for example you could easily think it's laziness right um, and I think there's something in that <laughs> so. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Neil. And thank you, Krista, so much. Um, there is still opportunities to see um, Neil's exhibition. I'm removing the spotlights here. Um, Neil's exhibition that closes on Friday. Um, and you can make a reservation by visiting our website. Thank you so much again. It was really, really lovely. Thank you, Krista. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Liza. Thank you, Neil. Cheers.